planning to join us for Easter Fest, that will be pretty good. I'm thrilled to see so many of our new families using our parents' facilities these days as well. Can you hear us up in the parents' room, gang? Good to see you all. Enjoy, enjoy. They've got their gold class section up there. It's pretty good. There's no foot rubs today. Sorry, that's only once a month, um, but otherwise it's good. Who's ready for God's Word? Yeah. You ready for it? Pastor James Troop is the man who's going to bring God's Word to us today. He is an incredible fellow. He's a wonderful father. He's a wonderful husband. If you know his family, you know there's some really good things in go, that goes into the cake of the Troop family. There's a whole troop of troops, isn't there, Pastor James? Pastor James is a pastor, a servant, and a man of God, but he's also the CEO of a business. So he has a fascinating life to me because on the one hand, he spends most of his time outside the church, but on the other hand, he's highly responsive to the Word of God. He's trained in the Word of God, and he's actually passionate about the kingdom of God as well. I thought you'd love to hear from our last series, our last service in our series, Thrive, Not Survive, from Pastor James Troop, as he brings the word together. Would you please welcome Pastor James as he comes. Thank you, Pastor Ben. It's good to be here today. We've got two people who are excited about it. It's good to be here today, isn't it? Yeah, I'm in the right place. It's so good, so good. As Pastor Ben mentioned, we are in our last week of Thrive, Not Survive. It's about thriving, not just making it through, not just paycheck to paycheck, but living a life that is on the front foot, that is advancing and taking ground every day of our life. When we wake up in the morning, we don't go, oh, good God, it's morning. We say, Good God, it's morning. We get another chance to have a go and do something amazing. Just to recap on where we've been already in this series, our first message from Pastor Ben was about following Jesus instead of following the things in the world. Clicking into Jesus and say, yeah, he's got my like, I'm following him. And the next was that we should guard our hearts because it's the wellspring of life that we do those things, that we we set our minds on Jesus. And the third was that, like all grapevines, Jesus said, I am the vine. Vines grow on a trellis, and a trellis for us is a boundary, something that holds us in place and guides our life. And third, we work on life's five big controls. Our life is like a mixing desk, and we've got to take control to make sure that we have positive emotion, We have engagement and flow in life. That we build healthy, meaningful relationships with the people around us. People at work, in our family to start with. You've got to have meaningful and healthy relationships in your family. True? Yeah? First, really good place to start. And then it's about a life of meaning and purpose. Realising that there is meaning and purpose in life. And we have to take control of that. And finally, that life is about achieving something. It's about doing something. It's about making a difference in the world, not just bumping along and hope we get there in the end. It's actually being purposeful and deliberate about what we do. If you've missed any of these, can I just really encourage you to go back and watch them on YouTube. You can find all of the messages on YouTube. And if you're watching today from home or sometime in the future, that's the amazing miracle about YouTube and about social media is that people may be watching this years from now. And God is not limited by time or space, but God can be touching people. You might be watching this years in the future. Can I just say, or you're here right now, can I just say you have an appointment with time, with God in time. You have an appointment with eternity this morning. God knew you would be here. It wasn't an accident. You just happened to bump along. You know, the, I saw Alan Bonfield a bit earlier. Where, where are you? He's hiding there. There he is. Um, he turned up to, it's no accident, Alan, you're here today. God has got something to do in your life today. Just have your heart open to him. If you go outside, you would have heard him come in. He's the guy with the repent for number plate on his motorbike. Repent for? Repent for what? What's that? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's time to turn back to God. I just love that. 
evangelising everywhere he goes, everyone he rides on the road is getting a message, has to think about it. So really this series has has been about what shapes our life. And it's about shaping our life and making deliberate choices on what, what the shape of our life looks like. And what does shape our life? Let's see if this is going to work for me. Maybe not. Push another button. Any button will do. Oh, yeah, it's working. Yay! Do I use this one, Pastor Ben? You're the expert. The underneath, the side one on the top. I've got it now. Forward and back. That's easy. So what shapes our life? Well, here's a guy called Dr. Jim Taylor. Now he looks kind of thoughtful about life, but what's amazing about this guy is when he was 13 years old, four foot nine, a scrawny kid, he said, I'm going to be the world's fastest snow ski, snow skier, the fastest snow ski racer. That's what he said, which was kind of crazy because he comes from the state of Connecticut in the US, and there's kind of a saying about Connecticut and snow, can any great skiers come from Connecticut? We've kind of heard a saying like that before. You know, can any great skiers come from Connecticut? And the truth is, he was scrawny, and he was little, and everyone was bigger than him. And he struggled with many things. But you know, with all the obstacles he had to face, he says, Something switched inside of him. He struggled, he struggled, and then something switched. And it's my prayer this morning for us, if you're watching online, if you're here today, that something switches on the inside of us. Maybe you've been facing a battle. Maybe you've been facing a struggle. But this morning I pray that something switches on the inside of you and it turns around. You know, I was riding on my bike My motorbike, I'm Scout one out there, by the way. Um, That's what with the hairdo and, you know, trying to grow this, but I'm getting there. Anyway. (laughs) I was riding my bike and I'm just riding along and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke. It was just out of the blue. I was going... God, I feel out of balance. My life sort of, I don't know what's happening right at this moment. There's this, I had this pang of uncertainty just for a second. And I went, God, what's this about? And I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me. God can speak to you. Hello? If you haven't heard from God yet, God, I don't know how he does it exactly, but he kind of speaks to your heart or in your mind or your spirit. I'm not quite sure how that works, but he speaks to us. And I'm riding along and I'm going, God, I'm just having a moment of insecurity here. It might be because I was going to preach today. No, but it wasn't that. And he said, yes, you're changing gear. I'm changing gear in your life. Something's switching in your life. And God wants something to switch in all of our lives. He takes us through stages. And when we come to those moments where God wants to take us in a different path, he switches, he comes and he does something on our life and changes gear. He said, I'm changing gear. You're changing gear. And I went, okay, we can do that. That's okay. So this young guy, scrawny, four foot nine, 13 year old, he struggled and he struggled and something switched. You know what? He has become one of the recognised authorities on the psychology of performance and sport and family. He served as the professor of psychology at various universities. He's been a consultant to Olympic teams around the world. He's written a thousand articles, including including for peer-reviewed journals. He's been the author of 19 books and he's co-edited about five textbooks on psychology. This is this scrawny kid who's going to be the fastest ski racer in the world. Well, actually, he didn't become the fastest ski racer in the world. But he did make the US ski team. And he got a second degree black belt in karate. Not bad for a scrawny kid. Had to do something to look after himself. And he now holds the Ironman triathlon title for his age group. 
in the United States. He holds the national title. This guy. And he's also been a three-time world champion medalist. That's something. He did it. Might not have got to his, the full capacity of what he was hoping for and dreaming for, but something changed. And you know, Dr. Jim identifies that there are five powerful forces that shape our lives. And as a psychologist and scientist, he's come up with these things. Genes, your gene pool, where you were born, the family you are born into, shapes your life, your upbringing, your childhood, what happened when you were a kid. All of these things shape our lives. Popular culture, Facebook, TikTok, Insta, they all shape our lives. And one of the things which is probably most profound, and some of you people who are a little grey-haired like I am, technology has had such a profound impact in shaping the lives of people. Young people, you just kind of grew up with it and you don't kind of realise it. But as older guys look at it, I grew up with a valve radio. I used to have to wait for about two minutes when you turned the switch for it to light up and some noise to start coming out. Technology has a profound effect at shaping our lives and also unexpected events. That accident, that death in the family, that child that you weren't quite expecting, there's been a few of them. You know what? They're wonderful and they change your lives. But all of these things... Dr. Jim says, with all of these influences that seem... How do you change your gene pool? How do you change the family you grew up in? Well, he says, the gene pool doesn't matter necessarily determine the outcome, it does determine where you start at the beginning or what rank you are at the start line, but it doesn't determine where you finish. Yeah. And your family and your upbringing, you can't change the family you were born in, but you can change your destination. And you can choose whether you're going to let that shape your life for the rest of your life or whether you're going to move around, move, up, move ahead. This week, I want us to look at a Bible-shaped life. We have a force that has the power to shape and change our lives like no other. And that is the Word of God. And it's about being wrapped around the Word of God. In the book of Psalms, we read this. We're talking about thrive, not survive, and it's what it means to have a life that is shaped to flourish. If you want a, a tree to grow, you need to prune it. You need to shape it so that it bears fruit. And the psalmist said it this way. Those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night, they are like trees planted along the river, bearing fruit in each season. Think about that. Every season of life, whether it's summer, autumn, winter or the spring season, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, never wither and all they do prospers. This is the life that God has for us. When we wrap our lives around the Word of God, when we meditate on the Word of God day and night, something transpires in our life, something changes in our life. You know, I want to talk just a moment about that word, Meditate or meditating. And when we think about meditating, actually, bear with me just a second. I need a little sip of water for this. God is good. How are you? All good? Are you still with me? Yes, you could have been with the Pastor Paul at IC Church today, but you got me instead. <laughs> Pastor Paul's got more hair. I know, but it's all right. I'm catching up. He's catching up with me and losing his hair. Anyway, most of us, when we think about, or anyone who kind of grew up in my generation, when they think about the word meditate, you kind of get this idea. And it goes, 
난 싱거냐 마바키지 바바 Again 난 싱거냐 마바키지 바바 You know what it means? Something loosely like this. It's Koza. I can't do the click. Koza. It's from Zululand, South Africa. And it means something like this. Behold, he comes. The Lion King. My people. Your father. Na he comes. Behold the Lion King. My people, he's our father. But that's all good. But that's not the type of meditation we're talking about. <laughs> the Hebrew word in that verse is Hogo, say hogo with me. Hogo, you can do better. Hogo, hogo, and that word literally means this: to meditate, to growl, to muse, to utter, to mutter, meditate, plan, plot, speak, imagine. That's what it means to meditate. And it said in that verse that he meditates on his word day and night. He mutters his word day and night. He utters his word day and night. He meditates on it. He devises around the word of God. He plans around the word of God. He speaks the word of God. He imagines the word of God doing mighty things. For this reason, he's given us his very great and precious promises, the Bible says, that we may participate in his divine nature and escape all the trials and the corruptions and the perplexities in this world and share in a glorious inheritance with him. You know, and Pastor Ben did it this morning too. People often kind of comment about our kids, oh, you must be so proud with your kids. And we kind of go, yeah, yeah. Oh, you must be such great parents. We go, uh, how many parents here really feel like they're great parents? Don't see too many hands going up. We, we haven't really always felt like we're great parents. But, you know, one thing, we've always tried to wrap our lives around the Bible and wrap our lives around the Word of God. Ever since we gave our hearts to Jesus, it's been seeking God in his word. And, you know, we've always tried to look after God's house and care for his people and be kind to all those around us. And as we heard last week, if you look after God's house, he looks after yours. If you look after God's children, he looks after your children. But there's something else, you know, in the midst of all of this that I did and they, these are my memory verse cards. Now, these are like 30-something years old now. They're all tattered and creased and, you know, and using these, I've just done my best to hogo. I've just done my best to wrap myself around the Word of God. And there's so many good scriptures like, there was this one, Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Or this one, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And I tell you what, when I first gave my heart to Jesus, I'd only ever read one book in my life, and it was only 125 pages, besides Clifford the Big Red Dog. <laughs> but my mum read that one to me. I really struggled to read, seriously. And I sat there when I first got saved with a, with a dictionary and the Bible, and I'm going, it took me four 
It took me two hours to read four chapters every morning. I was so slow and it was so hard to do. And I'm so grateful that the entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And then there's this one. Here, open. Great peace who love, their law, who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. We need to cultivate a love for the word of God. We need to work and practice at it and begin to see the delight of seeing wondrous things in his word and seeing them outwork in our lives. And then there's this one, the law of his God is in his heart, his feet do not slip. Oh, how many times I've been grateful for that one. That I've hidden your word in my heart that I should not sin against you, O oh Lord. But there is actually a bit of a downside to memory verse cards, just in case you want it. Everything about them is wonderful and the fact that we get to sit there and go, oh, how I love your law, I meditate in it all day long. Oh, how I love you, Lord. And I, I get to... My wife used to say, would you stop groaning? Every time I used to eat, I used to go... Mm-hmm. She go, you, you're doing it again, you're growling. I used to growl when I ate. Mm-hmm. Yum, 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 yum. Yum. And that's what we need to do with the Word of God. We meditate, we ruminate. Mm-hmm. Yum. We mutter, we speak it over, we plan, we devise, we imagine, we dream. The Word of God gets in us and we start to dream dreams. And we begin to see visions and we imagine the person that God's bringing us into the reality of. The real me, the real you, God wants to bring us there. But there is a downside to memory verse cards. And it goes something like this. Now this is my granddaughter, her name is Sage. If they called her Raven, I would understand. But this is Blue Texter, and she is very inquisitive. Now, all my life, one of the first things that, when she was become a toddler, one of the first things she did was find my memory verse cards, and <laughs> well, they're so much fun. And Kathy comes, I come home from work one day, and she goes, "I had Sage today." And she found your memory verse cards. And I went, "Uh uh-huh, I know what that means. And I've got a pile of cards, much bigger than this. There's a couple of hundred of them in there. And it's just like disastrous. And I sit there for hours reassembling them, putting them all back in order, back in their little groups. And I think every single one of my kids has done this. (laughs) So there is a downside to memory verse cards. But hey, you can do this. Everyone? Quick, out with your phones. Young people, you need this. Memory verse, Bible apps. So good. Can you get it? Have you got it? Mm-hmm. Now, this program, if you want my list of Bible cards, I've transcribed most of them into this, you can say to me and I will email you the file and you can have my memory verse cards and we can compare notes and we can challenge each other and see how we're all going. But just let me say this. That the Bible is no ordinary book. And the word of God is no ordinary word. The Bible, the word of God, has the power to shape and change and revolutionize and transform your life. You just need to wrap your life around it. You just need to make it your focus, make it your aim, make it your goal. My question this morning, and I want us to think about this, is what are we wrapping our lives around? Think about that. We're going to ask it a bit later, but what are we wrapping our lives around? Are we wrapping it around the Word of God? Are we wrapping it around His Word? Are we wrapping it around the life of Jesus? I tell you, with all those influences, you know, Jim Taylor said there, he said, you kind of wonder if we actually have any free will with so much influence coming upon us. So many powerful forces working upon us. 
But the truth is that the Word of God has power above every other influence in our life. If we will just wrap our lives around the Word of God and let the Word of God shape our lives, we will be transformed and we shall be like that tree planted by the river that yields its fruit in season that does not wither. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green and it never, fears, never fails to bear fruit. Another memory verse in Jeremiah. In the Gospel of John, he introduces Jesus and he does it in a very interesting way. He introduces Jesus as the Word of God. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, when you hear that, even us, most of us, even if you've haven't been in church long, or if you've, this is your first time to church, welcome. I trust God's going to touch your heart. Just be open this morning. If you're watching online, when we hear this statement, in the beginning, it makes us think of a, an ancient narrative. In the beginning, the world was without form and void. And the waters covered the deep. It reminds us, and, Je- and John is introducing Jesus the way he does with a very familiar narrative. Jesus, John introduces Jesus, the Word of God, very specifically when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's actually making a statement. He's saying, this is a new creation occurrence. This is a new creation event that's happening here when he introduces Jesus. Just like God created the heavens and the earth, John is saying here, there is a new creation at hand. It is the Word of God and the Word of God. Something miraculous has happened. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son of God who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This John heralds as the new creation, the new beginning. It's your new beginning today. If you haven't wrapped your life around the Word of God, if you haven't wrapped your life around Jesus, this is the opportunity this morning for a new beginning. If you're watching online, if you're sitting here this morning, it's an opportunity for a new beginning for you. Even if you've been walking with Jesus for many years, it's still an opportunity this morning for a new beginning. In the beginning is the Word. And it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelling... Dwelt literally means a tent. Jesus made human flesh his tent. Now we understand that a tent, who, who's got plans in life to live in a tent for the rest of their life? Not many of us. Some people might have lived in a tent for a little while, probably not by choice. I know some people have had to live in a tent for a while. I knew some people, some pastors, kids who grew up in a shed and all they had for wall was Hessian sacks hanging down. You wouldn't want to live there forever. And if you had to live in a tent, you wouldn't want to live there forever. But the point of that matter is Jesus entered into our temporary estate in these mortal bodies. He put this mortal tent on and the word spoke a new creation reality into being. He spoke the incarnation. God became human. God became human flesh and created a new reality, a new people, a new breed of humanity, a people that were no longer just spirit and flesh or or soul and flesh, they are now the habitation of God to dwell in. They are the tents for the living God to come live in. 
This is what Jesus did when the Word became flesh. You know, it's very frustrating. Some of those, some English translations, it says, we have seen his glory. Now, it's very hard, really. It's more like, behold, we beheld. But it's more like that. It's more like when the word becomes flesh, there's a, oh, moment. There's an aha uh-huh moment. There's, there's a switch goes on, a light goes on. Here's the light that comes into every person. Here's the light of the world that lights the heart and spirit of every person. There's an aha uh-huh moment. It's not just we've seen his glory. No. Behold. Oh, his glory. The reality is that Jesus did through his incarnation, through him becoming flesh, the word of God becoming flesh, is that Christ is now taking up residence in human lives and human hearts. And we are that glory. When The word of God comes into human flesh. Something transpires. Something changes. And it's a wow moment. When I gave my life to Jesus, when I received him, shortly after, I remember getting up one morning, normal thing, I get up, walk to the mirror, brush my teeth, and I look in the mirror and go, oh, what happened to you? The cloud's gone. The darkness is gone. Some, not all yet. Some of the depression's gone. Some of the hopelessness is gone. What happened to you? Who who are you? Oh, Oh, that's right. I received Jesus. Ah, that's what happened. Something changed. You know, Jesus... When you receive the word of God, it changes your life. It changes the shape of your life. When you wrap your life around Jesus, when you receive him, your life begins to change. You are transformed by the power of his word working in you. He brings his very nature and his love and his kindness and his goodness into our lives. You know, Jesus, what, what does it look like when you have your life wrapped around Jesus? What does it look like? How do we behave? What are the characteristics of a person who has their life wrapped around the word of God? Well, Jesus told us it, told us it himself. Oh, look at that. He didn't tell us that, but that's good. As many as receive him, he gives them the right or the authority to become the children of God to those who are believing into his name. When you believe, you are brought into the name of Jesus and into the power of Jesus. You're brought into his family, into his kinship, and your life is transformed. But Jesus told us what the the Bible-shaped life is like and what, what we need to look like, and it simply is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And secondly, and equally, love your neighbour as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. This is what a Jesus-shaped life looks like, to love the Lord your God. To love God... No, I love how simple it is. Simply this. Love God. Let him love you. And love him back. And that love overflows to others. So Jesus summarised the Bible-shaped life this way. To love the Lord your God 
with all your soul and strength. And what does that mean? It means this. Do something. All your strength. When you love God, you don't just sit there and go, oh, this is great, I'm loving God. No, it actually requires a response. You need to do something. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word, not just hearers, thereby deluding yourselves. That word deluding, that word's also described as deceiving yourself. It's the word paralogizume. Paralogizume. And para means next to or near. And logizume means to determine, to purpose, to decide. So this word logizume literally means to deal with reality. It's reality. And the importance, it's in Romans 6.11, it's, Paul uses the same word, legitime, and he says it this way. He says, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive to God. Reckon yourself. It's an accounting term. It says, add it up. Do the maths. So do the maths. And it's an amazing thing. If, if I legitime or reckon that my bank account has $25 in it, it has $25 in it. If it doesn't have $25 in it, it's not legitime. It's not adding up the numbers. It's not doing the maths. It's, de it's delusion. If you think you've got a million dollars in the bank and you've only got 10 cents, you're, you're deceiving yourself. You're deluding yourself. When you go to the bank, when you go to the ATM to get some money out, it goes, nee, nee. We don't like that noise. Nee, nee. So this morning, I need to ask myself, we need to ask ourselves, am I a doer of the word? Or am I just deluding myself? You know, that word is really amazing. It's actually saying that legitime is a transaction. It's an adding up. It's a reality. And if we're para logitsume, it means that we're next to it. We're not in it. We're near or next to reality, but we're not actually in reality. And the word says, be doers of the word so that you're not just next to the reality of a life that's Bible-shaped and a life in Jesus and the goodness and the wonder and the power, he says, be doers and be right in the middle of it, not next to it, not running parallel going, oh, yeah, this is great, and you're not experiencing all the goodness of the life of God because it's over here somewhere. Don't do that. What we need to do, and the second, there's an action that needs to happen for it to become real in our lives. And that means we need to be doers of the word. We need to actually read our Bibles. We need to actually meditate on our Bibles and read it and read it and mutter it and chew it and chew it. And then we need to pray. And we need to love our neighbour as ourselves. Jesus said that's what it looks like. Serve others with our strength, with our gifts, build bridges into people's lives, have meaningful relationships with people because the life of God needs to flow. It's not a stagnant pond. The love and the life and the nature of Jesus is a river that goes out. It's a river that when people are come into contact with it, they begin to flourish. People should flourish when they're in contact with us. It's my prayer at work as, a, as an employer that people flourish under my leadership, that people flourish because they're involved in my life. It's so important that we just give a little bit and love and share and care, all of these things. Be kind and gentle and patient with people. Even when they act really stupid sometimes, still love them and care for them and pray for them and believe for them. 
And the third thing that Jesus said, that we should live a missional life. The Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. And a life that is wrapped around Jesus, a life wrapped around the Word of God, understand this morning. It's a life that lives a dying world to save. It's a life that would rather die than give in just to see one person say yes to Jesus. Just to see one other person get a glimpse of how good it is to have their life wrapped around Jesus and wrapped around the Word of God. And they learn it from our example as we wrap our lives around Jesus and we go to them in the love of God and in the love of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. The love of Jesus constrains us and propels us out into the world to make people know his love. If I can have the, minister, the music team come up, please. Jesus said, talking about his ministry, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The word of God, the seed of God, needs to be planted in the earth for it to bear fruit. It needs to die. And Jesus said, speaking of himself, saying that he was going to need to die so that many people could receive eternal life. He was willing to go to the cross and bury his life in the grave so that by, because he had done no wrong and had done, committed no sin, it was justice for God through his power and through the Holy Spirit to raise him up from the dead. And Jesus now is the spirit of a man who has paid the price and the penalty of sin. This is who Jesus is and this is what Jesus has done on the cross. He has paid the penalty for sin as a human being, as a person. And he has gone to the grave. He's carried it to the grave, paying the penalty, gone to the grave. But he has also been raised from the dead. And the word tells us if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead shall also give life to these mortal bodies and you'll, you will be changed when you receive Jesus, the word of God. Maybe you've never heard this message before. Maybe you've never had a chance to wrap your life around Jesus. But can I encourage you this morning that if you will wrap your life around Jesus, your life will change. If you wrap your life around Jesus, if you wrap your life around the Word of God and you receive Him, as many as received Him, He gave them the right, the authority and the power to become the children of God. It's so good. It changes your life. Once I was drug bent, crazy hazed. My life was just a, a mess and a shambles. I'm lucky to be alive. No, I'm not lucky. I'm blessed to be alive because one day Jesus spoke into my life and it turned it all around. It's been a growth. Didn't, some things happened all instantaneously and other things I've been working at, working at, working at. But I tell you what, it's a continuous life of transformation. It's a continuous life of growing in love and growing in his gratitude. When people say, oh, you must be so proud of your kids. No, we're just so grateful that we've got a good God who rescued us. And that rescue extended to our family and to our family's families. Yeah. Kathy's relatives, I've only got two sisters, one's gone on to be with Jesus. They got saved. My parents-in-law got saved. Their family started going to church. Old Auntie Nell in her 80s had been going to church all her life. And she realised that when she's speaking to me, she says she'd never been baptised. And she goes, I haven't been obedient. I know, but I haven't been obedient. I must get baptised. And what a stir it created when Auntie Nell has to get baptised. The whole family went, whoa, what's going on there? As we finish today, maybe you've never wrapped your life around Jesus and you haven't experienced 
the wonder and the greatness and the goodness of when you receive the Word of God, His name is Jesus. And you begin to, you believe in His Word, that whoever shall believe in Him will not perish, but you will receive His eternal life. You will receive a new nature today. If that's you this morning, let's just bow our heads in prayer for a minute. The um, new Christians team are just going to look around. So if you see someone who's having to look around, that's what they're doing. And they're not cheating. (laughs) But if that's you this morning, I want us to pray together. And we're all going to pray together. In fact, can I just get us all to stand up as we finish tonight, today? Sorry to disrupt you. Leisurely Sunday morning. (laughs) But I just want us to stand to honour the Word of God. Behold, He comes, the Lion King. My people, He is your Father. And the question this morning, if you haven't received Him, if you haven't received Jesus, if you haven't believed and received the Word of God this morning, you haven't wrapped your life around Him, this is your opportunity to put away those other things that you've been wrapping your life around and hoping to find hope out of. Wrapping yourself around your job, wrapping yourself around sport or gaming, whatever it might be, social media. There's a million things that we can all wrap our lives around. And there's a million things that can influence us. But there's one thing that can change our lives in a way that no other things can shape and influence and transform our lives, and that is the Word of God. His name is Jesus. And as many as received Him, as many of those who accepted Him in and wrapped their lives around Him, He gave them the right and the authority and the power to become children of God. This morning, if you have not done that before, and this morning you want to wrap your life around Jesus and let go of some of those other things that are not working anyway, there's a promise and a guarantee this morning that if you wrap your life around Jesus, if you receive him this morning, you will be changed. Not people telling you what to do, not religion. Jesus, him alive and living in your heart, transforming you. Is there anyone this morning, as we've got our eyes closed, anyone this morning who'd like to receive him for the first time? You want to wrap your life around him? Anyone? Now for the rest of us. And there might be some people here you didn't put your hand up for whatever reason. That's all right. We've all got a chance to pray now. I think we can all fairly say this morning as we're standing, that we could love him more dearly and walk with him more nearly. We could walk closer with him. And I'm asking us all, I'm asking myself, I'm asking you, friends, the ones who God loves. What have we been wrapping our lives around? And this morning, I just feel to stir us up to commitment as we finish the service to say, Lord, I'm going to wrap myself around you. I'm going to spend more time in your word. I'm going to spend more time in prayer. Maybe for you, it's just going to be five minutes in the morning. When you rock up to work, instead of getting out, arrive five minutes early and just sit there and say, Lord, here I am. Pick up the Word. Use the Memory Bible app. This morning as we're in this place, as we finish, I just want us all to pray together. We're standing in His presence. He is here. Wherever two or more are gathered in His name, He is here. And he wants to take a fuller possession of your life. There are things, you know what you've wrapped yourself around is actually holding you back from the purpose that Jesus has for your life. And you need to 
unwrap from some of those things this morning, just as we're in this place. What is he speaking to us that we need to unwrap about, unwrap from? The Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. I can't tell you exactly how he does it. Jesus speaks to our heart. And he's here right now. We're going to pray together just in this moment. What is he speaking to us about? What is he speaking to us about ways that we can wrap our lives around him more completely? Time we can put aside. Ways we can schedule just to be alone with him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you so loved us, that you sent your only son, Jesus, to do what we could not do, as we heard Jack say before today, to pay a price we could not pay, to do a transaction that we could not do ourselves, but you came, you were obedient, Lord Jesus, obedient to the voice of the Father, going to the cross, scorning and despising its shame, taking the shame upon yourself, taking all of the misdeeds, all of our misdeeds, all of our sins, as it were, upon yourself, taking them away from us, nailing them to a cross so that we could stand before you holy and blameless this morning. That's a miracle right there. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And right in this moment, Lord, I just ask that you would show us how to draw closer to you. Your word says draw close to you and you'll draw close to us. What things have we become wrapped around? What things have we thought we were engaging in them, but really they've just become anchors and snares and things that we've become entangled in that are holding us back. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I just pray that those things be broken from our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare the liberty of the power of the Son of God in people's lives, in our lives right now, that those things that seem to be shackles and snares, those things that seem to be wrapping around our lives or we've got wrapped up in right now, I declare that those those powers and those influences, those things that would shape us are broken in Jesus' name. And we are set it free. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And we will walk about in freedom because we've sought out your word and we've hidden your word in our hearts that we might walk in step with you. We thank you, Lord. Have your way in us. Teach us to walk more fully. Teach us to lay our lives down. Teach us to love our neighbour more fully. Lead us, Jesus, and teach us what it means to deny ourselves that we, like you, if we remain as a single grain but don't bury ourselves into the lives around us, if we don't, take up our own cross and follow, we remain alone. But if we will deny ourselves and die to ourselves, we will bear much fruit. This is your promise. And you demonstrated it. And we thank you, O God, that it is also what it means to wrap our lives around you. We will see people, our loved ones, our friends, our neighbours, our children, our grandchildren, open their hearts and respond to you, Lord Jesus. That is why we are here. And we thank you and we are ever so grateful. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much today. Ali, if you want to. Pastor Ben. Hey, come on, why don't we thank Pastor James Troop for a great word this morning. I don't know about you, but that could be one of the first times I've ever heard someone preach with a mohawk haircut. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Tell your friends. Our preacher had a mohawk on the weekend. I'm not getting one, but it suits you, James Troop. 
If I'm casting for Mad Max, you're in my film, that's for sure. Hey, thank you for joining us. Come on, one more time. Let's say thanks to James. Let's be people who wrap our lives around God's Word this week. Hey, we're going to close the service with a song. We're going to have the band lead us. Uh, but just a quick reminder, if you're new or visiting, we would love to meet you. We'd love to find out a bit about your story. Stick around for lunch. For all of you regulars, stick around for lunch. Lunch today is homemade lasagna, salad, and garlic bread. We want to get some, Danielle. Let's have it. Um, yeah, and uh, you can hang around. You can get that from our cafe area. Our team have gone to great lengths to cater for you. We love you. Don't forget tonight, if you want to come on a missions trip to Elizabeth with us, you don't need to have shots or get a passport. You may, you may need to speak a different language. It's okay. It won't be as bad as it was in Alice Springs, that's for sure. And uh, so join us. Let's finish. We love you. Bye.